Roda Viva começa agora, para todo o Brasil, em transmissão pela TV Cultura e suas emissoras afiliadas. Também estamos em todas as plataformas digitais e é possível assistir a essa entrevista e as demais no nosso acervo, a qualquer tempo, tanto no app Cultura Play, quanto no nosso canal do YouTube. Não é todo dia que recebemos aqui um dos grandes romancistas americanos contemporâneos. Na verdade, a revista Time, em 2010, dispensou o um dos e o classificou como o grande romancista americano atual, graças a uma obra que, ao retratar famílias ou períodos específicos, consegue capturar o espírito do tempo ou a alma complexa que construiu os Estados Unidos. O seu novo romance renova essa ambição, ao mesmo tempo em que mostra a maturidade do escritor, ao abandonar uma certa arrogância e ironia e mergulhar de forma desarmada nos conflitos de cinco personagens de um núcleo familiar no meio oeste americano no início dos anos 1970. A culpa e os dilemas morais, muitas vezes ligados à religião, tema no qual ele se debruça como nunca antes em seus livros, são o fio condutor que o leitor de Encruzilhadas vai encontrar. Esse livro acabou de ser publicado pela Companhia das Letras aqui no Brasil. E para falar desses desafios e também das muitas análises consideradas pessimistas e ranzinzas sobre política, redes sociais, ambientalismo e outros temas atuais, mas que se mostraram acertadas, temos a honra de receber virtualmente, direto do seu escritório na Califórnia, o romancista e ensaísta americano Jonathan Franzen. Jonathan Earl Franzen nasceu em Western Springs, Illinois, em 1959. Escreve para as revistas The New Yorker e Harper's. Já foi finalista do prêmio Pulitzer e vencedor de diversos outros, como National Book Award e James Tite Black Memorial Prize. Foi eleito pela revista literária Granta um dos 20 melhores jovens romancistas americanos. Em 2010, se tornou o primeiro escritor a estampar a capa da revista Time em mais de uma década. Também é um amante, observador e militante pela preservação de pássaros. Para entrevistar o escritor Jonathan Franzen, nós convidamos Pedro Pacífico, advogado e produtor de conteúdo digital literário. Gabriela Maier, jornalista e crítica literária, apresentadora do podcast Café da Manhã, da Folha de São Paulo. Carlos Graeb, diretor do portal O Antagonista e da revista Cruzoé. Juan de Souza Gabriel, repórter do jornal O Globo. E o Biratã Brasil, editor do Caderno 2 do jornal O Estado de São Paulo. Contamos ainda com os desenhos da quadrinista Luli Pena e a tradução simultânea de Leslie Cohen. Boa noite, Jonathan. Muito obrigada por estar conosco nessa noite. Bom, eu queria começar falando do seu livro mais recente, Encruzilhadas. A religião e a culpa estão presentes de muitas formas no livro. Tanto a religião enquanto um discurso, enquanto uma instituição da vida americana, como a espiritualidade e a forma como ela se manifesta em cada um dos seus personagens, muito ligada aos dilemas morais e à questão da culpa. O que veio primeiro? A ideia dessa família em perfeita e as suas encruzilhadas ou o imperativo de mergulhar nesse tema religioso e eu queria saber onde você buscou a referência desses grupos de jovens dos anos 1970. Um, grew up in the Midwest. The 1970s was a very important decade for me. I'd never really written about it before, um, which made it really fun and crossroads to just settle in to the time in my life that I have the most vivid memories of. Uh, and a lot of those memories had to do with the church uh, that my parents belonged to. So I was raised in the liberal Christian tradition. And for six years, I was in a youth group associated with that. And it was uh, an amazing time to be in a liberal Christian youth group because we were getting the tail end of the 60s. We were, uh, all of that sort of social tumult uh, was playing itself out in the context of a sort of religious group. It wasn't very religious. Um, it was as much a social work group as it was a Christian group. Um, but that left me with essentially a very positive experience with Christianity. And the subsequent 50 years in the United States, Christianity has become 
worse than unfashionable. It's become almost a dirty word for people uh, of my politics. And it was, uh, I did see a chance in this book to help us remember what it was like when Christianity was at the social forefront, was opposing war, was protesting for civil rights. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I did have I did have the notion of a church, and I really knew that church because I spent 12 years wandering around in it. And that's gold for a novelist, anything you remember that well. Certo. Graeme, por favor. Um, mais ou menos 30 anos atrás, no meados dos anos 90, o senhor escreveu um ensaio que ficou bem famoso na época e continua talvez um dos seus mais conhecidos. O nome em inglês é Why Bother? O nome em inglês no livro em que ele foi transcrito depois de sair uma revista, né? Que a gente poderia traduzir como Por que se importar? Por que se dar ao trabalho, né? E era sobre por que se dar ao trabalho de escrever? Para quem escrever? que ela estava uma espécie de crise em relação à sua vocação de escritor. Passados 30 anos desse ensaio, why bother? Por que se importar ainda hoje em escrever? Ficção, principalmente. Personally, I bother because I am happy when I am writing a novel. Uh, I don't need to write novels anymore. I don't need to pay my bills by writing novels. But to load a set of characters into my brain and have them live there for two years so that at every minute somewhere in my brain I'm thinking about this story, trying to solve problems on it. That is a very, very happy state to be in. So that's at the personal level. At the, at the social level, I think, I think serious fiction is a refuge from stupid narratives. We have a lot of, everything is very political. And in politics, the narrative is our side is right, the other side is wrong. In fact, the other side is hateful, it's horrible. They're terrible. Uh, they're destroying the country, whatever. These are simplistic narratives. And what literary fiction, serious fiction, has come to be over the past 300 years is a place where things are more complicated, where there are no heroes, no villains, where people are you know, a mix of good and bad, and they're wrestling with important questions of what it means to be good or bad. And even though the audience has diminished somewhat in our age of screens, I think uh, for people who still read, there's a real hunger for complicated narratives. Certo, Pedro. Jonathan, uh, o seu interesse pela natureza, pela conservação e pelos pássaros é muito conhecida já pelo público. Ao mesmo tempo, você uh, comentou em uma entrevista que a uh, a proximidade do trabalho de um grupo de ambientalistas com o cristianismo da sua infância. Só que, nas suas palavras, em vez de Deus, ali tem a natureza. E em seu novo livro, a religião está muito presente. Como é a sua relação com a religião hoje em dia? E seria a natureza e seu amor pelos pássaros a sua forma de religião, de exercer uma religião? Well, uh, not really. Um, I... I think some of the more meditative aspects of religion, being present, being mindful, paying attention, and experiencing joy in the world, um, I do find that uh, when I go out in nature and am around birds. I just love birds. And, and I, it's probably, yeah, it could be compared to going to church. Um, but. Uh, that connection I made in my mind between the Christianity that dwindled in liberal America uh, and the concern about the earth, particularly climate change, that kind of replaced that religion, um, that's, that's me as a critic. That's me as a, somebody analyzing what's happened in society, noticing, oh, isn't it funny? So much of the vocabulary that people now apply to climate change, end of the world, judgment day, human guilt, all of that, it's, it's, it was just really striking to me how much that sounds like old-fashioned Christian religion. Certo. Por favor, Juan. Boa noite. Eu queria continuar no tema da religião, 
Frenzen, no, como você disse, o cristianismo que você retrata no livro, ele é bastante progressista, engajado em lutas sociais, bastante diferente do cristianismo mais audível que nós temos hoje, tanto no Brasil quanto nos Estados Unidos, que se tornaram uma base importante da extrema direita. Ao escrever esse livro, como foi para você recordar essa face progressista do cristianismo no atual ambiente cultural? E se ao investigar esse cristianismo mais socialmente engajado, você conseguiu identificar, descobrir onde foi que ele falhou, onde foi que ele errou, que acabou perdendo espaço para os seus irmãos mais conservadores? Ah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think Christian belief has been difficult for a long time, really starting with the Enlightenment in the late 18th century people began to struggle to believe that there was a supernatural God or that there was a heaven or a hell. It just didn't really accord with a scientific view of the world. So a waning among intellectuals in religious faith has been going on for several centuries. Uh, nevertheless, as a social phenomenon, my parents were not believers, but they went to church because they thought it was part of being part of being there in their community, but also part of being a civilized person. And they were attracted to the ethical message in the New Testament. They actually, what Jesus was preaching about forgiveness, about loving your neighbor, loving your enemy, that made sense to them. And, 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 and I admired my parents. And I think the fact that people of a liberal stripe um, no, no longer recognize what's in the Bible, no longer recognize how important those ideas are to what we now, what is part of our progressive faith, helping the poor, um, helping the, the people who are marginalized, preferring the people who are marginalized. That's what Jesus did. He went out of his way to hang out with these you know, the people on the margins of society, and he was more interested in them. We're just like that. But because the Christian church was kind of hijacked uh, beginning in the late 70s um, by the hard right, uh, people found, well, we just don't need that anymore. We can, we can have our own secular religion and not have to be associated with those crazy anti-feminist, anti-choice, uh, Reagan voting, Trump voting troglodytes. I, I think that's basically what happened. And But, but I, I, I persist in feeling that something was lost there, uh, that we, that there's a, there's, it would have been nice if instead of just retreating, we had said, no, your religion of money and oppression and racism and subjugation of women, that's not Christian. Um, and I, I think there's still an opportunity to say that, to challenge and even shame uh, that hard right politics that has been associated with what began as a very socially radical religion. Gabriela? A minha pergunta conversa um pouco com a do Juan. É, você retrata personagens no Encruzilhadas que são bastante ambíguos, têm suas ambiguidades bastante exploradas e que estão se debatendo, ou pelo menos alguns deles estão se debatendo, é, em dilemas éticos e para tentar viver uma vida mais ética. É, como é que você vê uma vida ética hoje a partir de tudo que você acredita e você acha que a religião pode ser um impeditivo para uma vida ética em alguma medida? You know, you know my, <laughs> my fundamental philosophy about living a good life is to try to be kind to people. Um, Again, I take that from my parents. It, it's also kind of a Christian message. Don't be mean, be kind. Um, and I think the world would be a better place if people were kinder to each other. And if, and if you want to talk about the environment, if we were kinder to the planet that sustains us, if we cultivated an attitude of kindness toward nature and toward the animals and plants in it. Um, 
it's hard to go wrong if you if your fundamental position is not hostile, not angry, but rather kind. Uh, that's my personal philosophy. In a novel, people are, if the novelist is doing his job, you are finding people in moments of crisis, and crisis usually consists of making a decision. I can go this way or I can go that way. And when you're trying to figure out which way to go, you tend to be thinking in terms of, well, what's the right thing to do? And in many cases, what the right thing to do is not what you really want to do. There's a conflict there, which is, again, tasty to the novel. The novelist loves <laughs> conflict of all kinds. Um, and, and so even though this is my first novel in which there's much religion, um, I've always been interested in characters who are wrestling with the problem of what's the right thing to do. Vira a tampa. É, eu li uma entrevista sua e uma, um detalhe me chamou a atenção de você dizer que não é um, um romancista muito interessado em escrever sobre famílias. É, então, em, em, aqui no Encruzilhada, o seu interesse seria uma estratégia narrativa para reunir histórias independentes, mas que estão inter, interconectadas? I have said that I'm uncomfortable with being described as a family novelist. Um, it's true that there are families in all of my novels, uh, but, you know, it, a real family novel is something like Budenbrooks, where you follow, a no, where the, the focus is entirely on the family and you meet multiple generations, the father is this way, the mother is this way, oh, and then the children are this way, and, and, and that's a family novel. I had not written one of those until Crossroads. And I think, you know, I'm the kind of person who to, who, who likes to upset people, <laughs> I guess, um, or at least upset expectations. And having said so many times, but I'm not a family novel. Freedom is not a family novel. Freedom is a novel with a family in it. Um, I thought, you know what? Now I'm going to write a family novel. <laughs> so. And, and with the intention of, of tracing what happens to a family over several generations and over the passage of many years and really putting it at the center. I've always been interested in family. It's not that it doesn't interest me. It interests me tremendously. And families are very valuable to the novelist because everything is intense and inescapable. Um, but this is the first time I've really set out to say, okay, you call me a family novelist, I guess I'm a family novelist. E vamos ter uma trilogia, né, Jonathan, desta família. É, a gente mergulhou muito no Natal, no pré-Natal dessa família, na Páscoa. É, é possível dar algum tipo de spoiler de para onde vamos caminhar nos outros dois volumes? You know, I would, it's very nice of you to have me on this show. I understand it's a huge show in Brazil, and I would like nothing more than to repay that favor by telling you a lot about where the story goes. The problem is, I don't know exactly where the story goes. Um, and that's necessary for me, because if I had it all planned out in my head, there would be nothing exciting about writing it. The excitement in writing is in discovering what the story is. But I can tell you here, I'll tell you something. Uh, it jumps forward in time. Um, I think the next, the next volume is basically set in the middle of the 1990s. How's that? That's a teeny Já é ótimo. Spoiler. Nós já agradecemos como leitores. Está aberta a roda, senhores. Gabriela. É, você falou em uma entrevista que o desafio do escritor é criar um universo pessoal com o qual todos nós possamos nos identificar a partir da observação da realidade, o que remete um pouco à ideia de universalidade. 
é, mas a gente está num momento de olhar com desconfiança para a universalidade ou, no mínimo, questionando se é mesmo universalidade ou é um olhar dominante que a gente aprendeu a chamar de universalidade. Você acha que, nesse contexto, o desafio do escritor mudou? A identificação que um livro é capaz de gerar hoje é menos abrangente, mais segmentada? That's a great question. Um, I don't sit in my office here thinking, oh, how can I write a universal novel? Um, I'm just working with the material I have, which is very personal and is the material of a white male American. Um, nevertheless, one hopes as a novelist The, 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 the greatest thing you hope for is a sense of recognition in a writer, uh, in, in a reader, excuse me, um, that, the, the, that even though the experience is quite different, perhaps, from the reader's own experience, that you might say, oh, but I have been there. I've, 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 I've always seen that, but I've never noticed it. Here, the writer has noticed it. Um, and that can be something in the outside world, or it can be an emotion, it can be a state of conflict internally. Um, and to, and, and when you have that sense of recognition as a reader, you feel a connection. And I do think that fundamentally, literature is about that sense of connection. And you are not always, not every reader is going to connect with every writer. That's simply the fact. But I think, too, uh, there is something in the project of literature. I wouldn't say it's about universality, but I think it is about a sense of fundamental humanness. And we operate on the present, on the premise that people are all fundamentally alike. Uh, and that these many obvious differences um, in status and gender and identity of all sorts, um, those are important. But underneath, we ought to be able to understand what it's like to be any human being. And I think one of the jobs of the fiction writer is to help us understand what it's like to be someone who is very unlike us. Obrigada para a última do bloco. Jonathan, você, é, encruzilhada se passa nos anos 70, você já adiantou para a gente que o próximo deve se passar nos anos 90. É, eu queria saber, você está mais interessado em saber se como o passado é diferente do presente é, ou como diferentes épocas podem ser semelhantes? That's another good question. Um... One of the things that I discovered in the course of writing Crossroads, when I went back and remembered what it had been like in the early 70s um, in a Christian youth group, I, I found all of these ideas that, are, that seem very new now, worries about cultural appropriation, worries about white privilege. We were actually having those conversations 50 years ago. Um, in the context of a Christian enterprise. And it is interesting to see that, although things change tremendously, uh, they also don't change that much. Um, I, for me, the attraction of the past is that it is a very, very different world. Um, I noticed Uh, how wonderfully liberating it was not to have to have mobile phones in a novel. That if you wanted to, if you wanted to communicate with someone in 1971, you either saw them in person, or you might write a letter, or you would speak to them on a telephone. And if it was long distance, that was an expensive call. This was great for the novelist because it means that instead of having text exchanges, yeah, they can be interesting. Mostly, you have to put two characters in a room together. And as any playwright can tell you, things are very interesting when you get two people in a room together. Things become, it's just richer. Uh, and, you know, a dozen different things like that, when you move to a, a place in the past which is technologically different from our own world, Uh, it's just a fun place to be. It's 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 uh, it's 
kind of it's closer to the 19th century, weirdly, than it is to just 50 years later. Um, Maravilhoso. Com isso, então, a gente fecha o nosso primeiro bloco do Roda Viva com Jonathan Franzen, faz um breve intervalo e volta já já. Não sai daí. Cultura que emociona. Bradesco. Você leva isso para a literatura, essa ideia, assim, você acha que o livro tem que divertir muito mais do que educar, do que formar? Esse raciocínio Olha, eu usa, acredito né? muito que a literatura educa, não porque ela ensina, mas porque ela é arte. E eu acredito na educação pela arte. Eu acredito que quando o livro é bom, quando o livro é literariamente bem escrito, é uma forma de educação. Agora, não acredito, nem, nem acho que a pessoa que escreve deva se imbuir assim do espírito pedagógico, porque aí fica tudo muito chato. Né? Se você, querida, fizer um levantamento dos duzentos e tantos membros acadêmicos, você vai ver que a grande média a grande maioria é da classe média, quando mais, inclusive muitos de origem modesta. Portanto, não é um local da elite econômica ou da elite social. Um ou outro que tinha um nome de família mais significado, mais importante. Então, agora, quando você fala na língua, você não fala na língua culta, você fala na língua portuguesa em todas as suas vertentes variantes, todas as suas variantes. Tudo que se produz em literatura é língua portuguesa, entendeu? Não, não, isso, isso não existe. Eu tenho a impressão que você está equivocada, porque nós, nós temos que defender o que se escreve. Até defender, eu vou lhe dizer uma coisa, até o texto quebrado, o texto é, é, incorreto, não importa. É uma produção, é um livro, é uma criação tem toda a defesa da academia, mais do que da academia, de nós que escrevemos. Nós tivemos influências enormes, não é? de Jorge Amado, Graciliano Ramos, Mário de Andrade. O Guimarães Rosa até foi quem chegou menos, provavelmente, mas, por exemplo, Jorge Amado estava proibido em Portugal Sim. e era autorizado nas colónias, pensando que as colónias não liam não é? e, 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 portanto, ali não havia perigo. Agora, a, a situação já não é a mesma, infelizmente, quer dizer, nós agora não conhecemos o que é que de novo está sendo criado no Brasil, o que é que está chegando do Brasil, e, Mas... e a influência de Portugal agora é um, é um pouco mais presente, Portugal está hoje mais presente do que o Brasil. É, primeiro assim, lugar de fala na literatura, acho que não, né, porque é... Eu acho que a literatura é um espaço da liberdade. A Amanda está com uma, uma matéria na 451, belíssima, belíssima. É, a literatura em perigo. É, eu, eu, eu acho que lugar de fala não, no sentido de que é, é essa curiosidade e imaginação de se colocar no lugar do outro, uhum. que é... A, a base da literatura. E eu trouxe a literatura, mas a gente pode expandir para outras artes também, né? Sim, sim. Uhum. E eu acho que as mulheres, é, todo o corpo produz sentido à sua maneira. We just have to keep going. We have to keep telling the stories. And my approach to storytelling is I don't tell stories from a place of ideology. Estamos de volta com nossa Roda Viva Literário, que hoje tem a honra de receber o romancista norte-americano Jonathan Franzen. Jonathan, na sua resposta anterior, você diz que os, o passado já lidava com alguns dos dilemas da suposta modernidade, entre eles essa crise do homem branco. É, isso já era presente nos seus livros anteriores e aparece muito fortemente no Encruzilhadas em diferentes gerações, de uma maneira bastante crua, inclusive. Eu queria 
saber se esse incômodo também é seu, se você sente essa inadequação, esse sentimento de estar tá quebrado e de ter uma certa crise é, da masculinidade nos dias de hoje, se isso te, afri, te aflige de alguma maneira. I did have kind of a masculinity crisis. I I was an early strong kind of crazy feminist. Um, I got that in high school even. Uh, there was a strong feminist uh, component to my Christian youth group. Um, and then I went to a very liberal college. And I basically came out of that with the feeling that to be a man was to be guilty. Um, and to a lesser extent, to be white was to be guilty. And I tried to live like that for 10, 15 years, and it made me very unhappy uh, because, um, because I am a man. And I would say that in my 30s, I began to feel, why do I have to apologize? Uh, I, I still, I, it's difficult for me to read Philip Roth novels. It's difficult for me now to read a Joseph Heller novel, Catch-22. They are so sexist. That seems so ancient. That's not the kind of masculinity I'm interested in. But I do feel that to simply say all masculinity is, say, toxic, or uh, that men are inherently morally inferior to women because, oh, say, they can't help objectifying women. They look at how a woman looks and they're sexually attracted on that basis before they've even had a conversation with the woman. You know, those are, those are male behaviors that we're never really going to get away from. And if you try to respond by simply making yourself nothing, um, because, because what you are is so terrible, that's a recipe for unhappiness. And I think it's also a recipe for dishonesty. So, um, I, I try to populate my books with male and female characters. And I, I try very hard to do complicated female characters and fully engage with their subjectivity But I think it's important to include male characters as well and not to be dishonest about the way men really are. In Crossroads, one of the main characters, the pastor of the church, us, is pursuing this woman in the congregation. He wants, basically, he wants to have sex with her because he's only ever had sex with his wife. And, and his wife is more experienced, and this just bothers Russ. And he's, it's, it's the, he's fixed on, if only I could have sex once with somebody else, and specifically this woman in the church, then I would feel more like a man. Um, and I'm smiling as I say that because it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, and he knows it's wrong. It's wrong. It's, it's wrong to his wife. It's wrong from a religious perspective, but nonetheless, he has to have it. And that's the position I want to be in as a novelist, where I'm watching a man. I'm not saying this is good behavior. We can all agree it's not good behavior. And yet, if you can, if you can make a connection with what it's like to be that character, and really inhabit that ridiculous desire of his, then, <laughs> then you start to forgive a little bit. And you forgive by laughing at the man, because that pursuit is just, at a certain level, ridiculous. Certo. Continuando o assunto da masculinidade que a Vera sugeriu, é, a sua carreira literária é contemporânea dessa politização do, da literatura. É, você falou um pouco como isso te afetou como homem, né? você era um feminista e depois como aprendeu a rir um pouco da, do, do quão ridículo pode ser ser homem, mas como isso te afetou como autor? Você acha que as críticas que você acaba recebendo são porque você acaba representando esse autor branco, heterossexual, economicamente privilegiado, homem, que hoje em dia não é mais tão bem aceito? Essas demandas por mais diversidade no cânone, por mais espaço para mulheres, para autores não brancos, isso afetou a maneira como você escreve e a maneira também como você lê e se relaciona com a literatura? I don't, re I don't read the reviews. I don't read criticism of my work. I'm aware that uh, there's a 
there is a, a suspicion of all white male writing now. There's really nothing I can do about it. Uh, I think, and, and, and it would be for me to try to make myself somehow not who I am, that's not going to work. That's a recipe for dishonesty. I can only try to write books that, um, that, that are true to who I am and in which I take care when I'm representing people who are not like me. Um, I put a lot of thought into how to represent uh, non-white characters and how to represent non-male characters. It is, I think, important for dominant white men to do that. Um, that you that you that you really actually be very careful, and in that respect, the discourse about cultural appropriation and the patriarchy and colonialism, I think that's all appropriate. You need to be very careful, but you also need to retain some sense of permission to write. And I have permission to write because I have a story to offer that you might enjoy reading. And that is my, my job is to provide the reader with something that is a pleasure to read. And if I do that job uh, while trying to be kind, um, that's all I can do. I, and what, what, what the critical universe has to say about that, I don't really care. I can't control it anyway. Vai, Abby, depois Pedro. Parece que nos últimos tempos surgiu uma nova preocupação para os escritores. Antigamente eles se preocupavam se a obra deles ia durar depois que eles morressem. Agora eles precisam se preocupar também se a obra deles vai ser alterada depois de eles morrerem por alguma editora que está preocupada com o uso das palavras que eles fazem. É... Essa é uma preocupação para você? Você acha que você está a salvo das intervenções que vêm sendo feitas em obras como as do Rodal, por exemplo? É... Ou você não liga com o que fizerem com a sua obra depois que você morrer? Oh, I do not want anyone to rewrite my work. Um, and you know, freedom of speech and the author's right to control her work or his work, those are very central uh, values for me. I would never want to be rewritten and certainly I would not want to be rewritten by uh, chat GBT. <laughs> um, I think we're a long way from chat GBT being able to write as well as I can. Um, but that's all terrible. I, I have to say that I don't think about a hundred years from now. I don't even think about 50 years from now because I won't be here in 50 years. Uh, I'm not one of those writers who's concerned about his legacy um, and, you know, not writing for the present, but writing for that future person who might. I don't care about that. Uh, I am interested primarily in, one, doing what I do best, uh, which is write novels, because that is a happy state for me to be in. And two, I'm concerned with writing books that might reach another living human being and mean something to that person. And, uh, you know, the future is completely imponderable. We don't know what's going to happen, although I am very pessimistic about where we will be in 50 years. Uh, and if you start worrying about, you know, the, the fate of the novel in 50 years or 100 years with all the new technologies and the change in language and the change in politics, Where does that get you? It does not get you to a happy place. Uhum. Pedro? Jonathan, você disse agora que você está autorizado a escrever porque você quer escrever para entreter as pessoas. Ao mesmo tempo, em uma entrevista, você disse que há algumas maneiras simples de distinguir entre puro entretenimento, um tipo de cultura de massa, e o que pode se chamar arte ou literatura. Para você, qual seria essa diferença entre o entreter o seu leitor, como você disse, ou esse tipo de entretenimento de massa que você uh, não entende como literatura, uma boa literatura. E, além disso, você não acha que tratar boa literatura e má literatura uh, seria uma forma de limitar a literatura para quem não pertence, para quem só pertence a uma classe intelectual? Eu tenho uma definição muito simples de 
the difference between mass entertainment and um, more serious literature, and that is the presence or absence of cliché. Um, cliché comes in many forms. Uh, I, will, I will be sent a book uh, to read, to, to, to look at, to, to maybe comment on, and I will see something like Quiet as a Mouse on page two, and that tells me this is not a serious writer. No serious writer would write quiet as a mouse. But the, the cliche has a larger meaning. In, a, a cliche is that uh, all, the, all the evil in this little world I've created is caused by this villainous character. And there is a hero who is, may have a few little flaws, but is fundamentally good. That is a cliche situation. Um, there are cliches of observation. There, you, you, you're describing a forest. There are certain sentences you would use to describe that forest that have been used a million times before, so many times that they are now cliche. A real writer, you feel like I'm seeing a forest for the first time. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's maybe a subtle definition of the difference, but for me, that's, that's really what it's about. Um, good writing is specific, could only have been written by the writer who wrote it. It's not interchangeable. You couldn't bring in another writer and write the same book. And, and what happens when you become yourself as a writer is you are there in every sentence and you are thinking about every sentence and you are trying to say something that is real and complicated and true rather than receiving these cliches from past work. That is the difference. Biratã? Jonathan, eu tenho uma curiosidade sobre o seu processo de escrita. Quando você chega finalmente ao ponto final do, do romance, é, o quão confiante você está que realmente aquele é o ponto final? Oh, I, I'm pretty sure I know when I'm done with the novel. I don't know until I get there how I'm going to do it. And with Crossroads, I was, I was in doubt until the last few weeks. I did not know how I was going to get out of the book. But when I figured it out, um, it ends with a scene between two siblings. Um, and when I realized that that was going to be a good scene, I knew I had a way out. Uh, that didn't mean I was confident in the book itself. It seemed so different from my previous novels. I wasn't sure I had done something good until I heard from my agent and my editor, and they said, oh, this is very good. Um, so, but, but in terms of knowing when I'm done, I, you, you, can, you can hear it. You can feel it click, and you say, okay, that's a, that will work as an ending. Maravilhoso. Gabi. Eu queria voltar aos clichês. É, narrar famílias infelizes é uma forma de evitar os clichês, já que as famílias infelizes são infelizes de formas particulares e buscar essas particularidades pode ajudar a evitar as repetições? We are referring to Tolstoy's famous line at the opening of Anna Karenina, and... It's a widely quoted line. The way I understand that is that he is essentially saying, no one wants to read a novel about a happy family. If there's a happy family, there is no, there, where's the story? Everyone is basically kind to each other and supportive and they're living their lives. And yes, people die, but people die in life and that happens. There's nothing there, only some kind of unhappiness is interesting to read about. Uh... Jonathan, no seu livro A Violência é sempre um aspecto muito particular e você acho que é quem escreve sobre violência de uma maneira é, que eu acho mais sutil e ao mesmo tempo mais assustadora, porque ela 
pode acontecer de uma forma muito brutal, mas ela quase nunca se manifesta dessa maneira, ela se manifesta mais no interior dos personagens. E tem uma personagem em particular no Encruzilhadas, que é a mãe, a Marion, que ela tem ímpetos muito violentos, mas ela também sofre muita violência, e ela tem um histórico de violência muito grande. É... Como você lida com esse sentimento de dosar até que ponto você vai expor a violência nas suas obras? Um, the, the mother in Crossroads, Marian, uh, was, was really badly abused uh, when she was young. Uh, and there was in particular one very evil man. Uh, That was very hard for me to write. I don't like to write about evil characters. Uh, I'm more interested in ambiguous characters who have some evil but some good. Um, I, I, I let myself go there in part because I needed some, some comparison with the less evil men in the book. Um, and also, I feel obliged to acknowledge that although I th men are not necessarily as bad as the current criticism makes them seem, there is such a thing as a really bad man. There are Harvey Weinsteins out there, mm -hmm. <laughs> and even worse than Harvey Weinstein. Um, the, the violence, I don't enjoy writing about it. I, I hate violence myself personally. Um, I come from a Swedish family. We're pacifists. Uh, I've never hit someone, uh, and I've never been hit. Um, but and so there is not actually very much violence in my later work. Uh, physical violence. Mm -hmm. There is there is one instance of it um, in Crossroads. Uh, <clears throat> a young woman hits another young woman, uh, and. I feel like even though it's just a very hard slap in the face, repeated a few times, um, because it's it's in the context of a book in which there's no other violence, um, it feels like a lot. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, except to say that uh, what there is more of is psychological violence. See, see. And uh, and that's that's more manageable because I'm familiar with psychological violence. I witness it around me all the time. Uh, I sit on an airplane and I hear behind me um, psychological violence between a mother and a child. It's really it's you know it's all around us, um, and and it's a, it's a more interesting kind of violence. People being shot. You know, it's all the same and it's all terrible. And, uh, yeah, not so interested in that. Maravilhoso. Tem mais uma pro... Diga, Pedro. Uh, Jonathan, em uma entrevista no final do ano passado, uh, você disse que passou uh, apenas oito anos da sua vida, mais ou menos, escrevendo, que a maior parte do tempo foi não escrevendo. Então, eu queria saber um pouquinho do Jonathan Leitor. Você passou mais tempo lendo na sua vida e uh, que obras e que autores te marcaram ao longo de toda a sua formação como leitor? Well, I've been a reader much longer than I've been a writer, and I've read a lot. So it's difficult to come up with a short list of books that have particularly meant something to me. Um, I have my favorites. Uh, what to say? Um, It's such a long list. In my 20s, uh, I led a very isolated life. I was married, and uh, my wife and I, uh, she was also a writer, we would um, spend six or seven hours a day writing and then have dinner. And then there were five hours in the evening, seven nights a week to read. And being ambitious to become a novelist, uh, for five years, I read 35 or 40 hours a week. Uh, and if you put in that kind of time, you can read all the great literature of the 19th century and most of the great literature of the 20th century. It was not necessarily any particular book. It was 
Um, it was fully mastering, fully absorbing the entire tradition of the novel, going back all the way to Don Quixote and Robinson Crusoe. Um, that I think that's more than any specific author. What has shaped me as a writer is um, really inhabiting a tradition understanding what the different choices you can make are. There's a big difference between Lawrence Stern and Tristram Shandy and uh, Dostoevsky and Brothers Karamazov. Those are, those are different choices. And if you've seen the whole thing, you can start to say, well, what is it that I want to do? What's the tradition I want to work in? Um, and, and that's really where I come from. Perfeito. Encerramos assim o nosso segundo bloco do Roda Viva. Vamos mais, para mais um breve comercial. Voltamos já já com mais Jonathan Fraser. Cultura que emociona. Bradesco. Você leva isso para a literatura, essa ideia assim... Você acha que o livro tem que divertir muito mais do que educar, do que formar? Esse raciocínio Olha, você eu usa, acredito né? muito que a literatura educa, não porque ela ensina, mas porque ela é arte. E eu acredito na educação pela arte. Eu acredito que quando o livro é bom, quando o livro é literariamente bem escrito, é uma forma de educação. Agora, não acredito, nem, nem acho que a pessoa que escreve deva se imbuir assim do espírito pedagógico, que aí fica tudo muito chato, né? Se você, querida, fizer um levantamento dos duzentos e tantos membros acadêmicos, você vai ver que a grande média, a grande maioria é da classe média, quando mais, inclusive muitos de origem modesta. Portanto, não é um local da elite econômica ou da elite social um ou outro que tinha um nome de família mais significado, mais importante. Então, agora, quando você fala na língua, você não fala na língua culta, você fala na língua portuguesa em todas as suas vertentes variantes, todas as suas variantes. Tudo que se produz em literatura é língua portuguesa, entendeu? Não, não, isso, isso não existe. Eu tenho a impressão que você está equivocada, porque nós, nós temos que defender o que se escreve. Até defender, eu vou lhe dizer uma coisa, até o texto quebrado, o texto é, é, incorreto, não importa. É uma produção, é um livro, é uma criação, tem toda a defesa da academia. Mais do que da academia, de nós que escrevemos. Nós tivemos influências enormes, não é? de Jorge Amado, Graciliano Ramos, Mário de Andrade, o Guimarães Rosa até foi quem chegou menos, provavelmente, mas, por exemplo, Jorge Amado estava proibido em Portugal Sim. e era autorizado nas colónias, pensando que as colónias não liam né? e, 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 portanto, ali não havia perigo. Agora, a, a situação já não é a mesma, infelizmente, quer dizer, nós agora não conhecemos o que é que, de novo, está sendo criado no Brasil, o que é que está chegando no Brasil. E, Mas... e a influência de Portugal agora é um, é um pouco mais presente. Portugal está hoje mais presente do que o Brasil. É, primeiro, assim, lugar de fala na literatura, acho que não. Né? Porque é, eu acho que a literatura é um espaço da liberdade. A Amanda está com uma, uma matéria na 451, belíssima, belíssima. É, a literatura em perigo. É, eu... eu eu acho que lugar de fala não, no sentido de que é, é essa curiosidade e imaginação de se colocar no lugar do outro, uhum. que é a, a base da literatura. E eu trouxe a literatura, mas a gente pode expandir para outras artes também, né? Sim, sim. Uhum. E eu acho que as mulheres, é, todo o corpo produz sentido à sua maneira. We just have to keep going, we have to keep telling the stories. And my approach to storytelling is I don't tell stories from a place of ideology. I'm a feminist.
Estamos de volta com Roda Viva, que hoje recebe o romancista e ensaísta norte-americano Jonathan Fraser. Jonathan, numa era em que as pessoas ouvem áudio numa velocidade acelerada, assistem vídeos de no máximo poucos minutos, você nos oferece esse catatal de 596 páginas com personagens que você mesmo disse são ambíguos, nem sempre com um final feliz e, com uma, e que retrata uma era analógica, sem celular, sem tecnologia, sem internet. Como você imagina que existe um público ávido por fazer essa imersão, por ter essa experiência, por se desconectar por algumas horas, durante algumas semanas, para mergulhar no universo dessa família? I think at this point, with the technology we have, uh, reading a book is a kind of refuge from the noise of the world. Um, it demands a different kind of attention, but it rewards a different kind of attention. You actually are setting up a world in your head. The, the writer has set up a world in his head and has populated it and told a story about it. And then you get this thick book and you read into it and that, um, that world begins to grow in the reader's head. And you, there's no way you can read a long book in a single sitting. Um, it's going to be many different sittings uh, to read the whole book, but you can go back to it and you lock into it immediately. And I find myself as a reader that I enjoy being in a book like that because after all the noise of the day, all of the distractions, here I can pick up the book and I can sink into a different world and I can be there. And it's a world in which things make sense. It's not necessarily pretty, um, it's not necessarily happy, but there is meaning in that world. And we live in such a overloaded world where it's impossible to find meaning. Um, I think the novel functions as a kind of refuge in the same way that uh, if you're having a crazy day or a crazy week and you go and spend an hour walking in a quiet park, just looking at what's around you, being in a different world like that can be very restorative. And I think that's what the novel offers in our current time. I believe that it's the same. It's the same with me. In your essay, the most recent book of essays, you're talking about the elections of 2016 e diz que desejava que o Facebook eh, tivesse filtrado melhor as mensagens de, de ódio, as mensagens mais estridentes que, enfim, que circularam naquele momento. Também faz uma crítica ao Twitter. Essa é uma discussão muito viva no Brasil de hoje. É, a ideia de que é preciso filtrar aquilo que acontece nas redes sociais. A solução que o Brasil está buscando é que essa filtragem seja feita por um órgão público, por uma repartição do governo ou algo assim, e não só pelas próprias redes. Como é que você enxerga uma solução como essa? Yes, I'm well enough versed in 20th century philosophy to know that there is no such thing as a neutral filter. Uh, and so I'm very suspicious of any kind of filter being imposed on social media. Uh, obviously, there are certain kinds of speech that should not be on these platforms. You shouldn't have instructions for how to build an atomic bomb. And certain kinds of hate speech, um, whether it's anti-Semitic or racist, white nationalist, I think it's reasonable to exclude anything that incites violence, um, anything that, uh, yeah, there, there, there's, there, there's extremity that's pretty easy to filter out, um, but different points of view, like the notion that vaccines uh, harm people or that uh, the uh, Americans were uh, building biological weapons plants in Ukraine and that the Russia was perfectly okay to go in and attack Ukraine because we were building biological weapons factories there. Um, you know, I don't think these things are true, but should they be filtered out? How do you do that? Um, who decides? And so I, I 
I guess I'm a pretty radical free free speech uh, advocate, and my feeling is that this has come into the world, and the only way we're going to get rid of it is that people at an individual level say, I don't like what this is doing to my life. I don't like being addicted to this technology that upsets me and makes me angry. And uh, I, I think it probably has to be more a matter of individual choice. Um, sadly, I would love to get all that junk off, off Twitter and off Facebook, but it can't be done. Not without... Yeah, not without imposing my own values on it, which I'm suspicious of. Miratã? Mm -hmm. Jonathan, eu queria voltar um pouco à sua ficção. É, eu acho a sua escrita muito hipnotizante, muito atraente. Às vezes, ela compete até com a, com a própria revelação da trama. Uma coisa que eu vejo, às vezes, assim, Dom Delilo, por exemplo. Eu queria saber se, para você, é, o ritmo é tão importante quanto a escolha das palavras. The ideal experience for me as a reader is to start a book and very quickly feel like the only thing I want to do is keep reading that book. And that has to do with a certain kind of narrative propulsion. Um, and yes, there is a rhythm to that. You, you follow a character up to a point where something interesting has happened and you want to know what happens next and then you pull away to a different character and you keep doing that and there is absolutely a rhythm to that that determines the shape of the book. Uh, however, 98% of the time I spend working on a novel is spent messing with sentences, trying to get the sentences to work. And there's a rhythm to the sentences as well. Uh, the thing lives or dies on whether each paragraph is something you want to read. And at this point in my life, I don't necessarily know what the next paragraph is going to be. So my writing life consists of what's the next interesting thing I can do? What's the next interesting sentence I can write? Um, there's a kind of rhythm to that as well, but it's really, it's, it's this constant search for something that will continue to engage a reader's attention. Quanto tempo leva a escrita de um romance como Encruzilhadas? Crossroads I worked on for 26 months, and that was preceded by several years of thinking about how to do it. Um, I've never spent less than five years working on a book. Um, much of the work is done before I start writing. I have to come up with some characters who I think are going to be interesting to read about. And that is an incredibly slow process. And it only gets harder because I have fewer um, intense characters from real life who I can think of when I'm creating the character. So it's, uh, but yeah, it's, it's two years of writing, two happy years of writing preceded by three or four years of very unhappy thinking. Wow. Huh. Frenzy, você sempre pareceu muito interessado em pensar o papel do escritor na cultura e o papel do romance na cultura. Mas, hoje em dia, a nossa cultura é cada vez mais digital e a literatura não tem mais a centralidade no debate público, na cultura que ela um dia teve. Dado esse cenário, qual o papel de um escritor? E você acha que é possível um escritor desempenhar esse papel se mantendo afastado das redes sociais, que é onde tanto da cultura acontece e das quais você é um conhecido crítico? Eu realmente acho que a experiência de ler is fundamentally compatible, incompatible with uh, the experience of surfing the web or monitoring your Twitter feeds or whatever. Um, the, the, it's, you know, if, if the mind is a laser beam and you, you, you watch it working when you're on social media, it's going ding, 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 ding. And when you are reading a good book, it's, like that, right, you just stay in one point. Those are completely incompatible. Uh, and I avoid social media because its values are so much not mine. It's fundamentally about self-promotion and about getting attention with extreme statements um, and extremely simple statements 
And my wish is to be absorbed in something long in which something like the real complexity of the world is represented. Uh, you know, the novel has historically only occasionally been a culturally and socially important force. Um, there were, when in the 19th century, when we didn't have social media, we didn't have television, yes, people looked to the novel for social instruction. It was a good way to raise awareness of social dysfunction. Um, that's a long time ago. We have, we have, we've retreated to a place where uh, the best we can hope to be as novelists is an alternative for people who are not satisfied with the narratives of the digital world. Com isso, então a gente encerra o nosso terceiro bloco, vai para mais um intervalo rápido e voltamos já já com muito mais literatura com Jonathan Fraser. Cultura que emociona. Bradesco. Você leva isso para a literatura, essa ideia, assim, você acha que o livro tem que divertir muito mais do que educar, do que formar? Esse raciocínio Olha, você eu usa acredito pra... muito que a literatura educa, não porque ela ensina, mas porque ela é arte. E eu acredito na educação pela arte. Eu acredito que quando o livro é bom, quando o livro é literariamente bem escrito, é uma forma de educação. Agora, não acredito, nem, nem acho que a pessoa que escreve deva se imbuir assim do espírito pedagógico, que aí fica tudo muito chato, né? Se você, querida, fizer um levantamento dos duzentos e tantos membros acadêmicos, você vai ver que a grande média, a grande maioria é da classe média, quando mais, inclusive muitos de origem modesta. Portanto, não é um local da elite econômica ou da elite social um ou outro que tinha um nome de família mais significado, mais importante. Então, agora, quando você fala na língua, você não fala na língua culta, você fala na língua portuguesa em todas as suas vertentes variantes, todas as suas variantes. Tudo que se produz em literatura é língua portuguesa, entendeu? Não, não, isso, isso não existe. Eu tenho a impressão que você está equivocada, porque nós, nós temos que defender o que se escreve, até defender, eu vou lhe dizer uma coisa, até o texto quebrado, o texto é, é, incorreto, não importa, é uma produção, é um livro, é uma criação, tem toda a defesa da academia, mais do que da academia, de nós que escrevemos. Nós tivemos influências enormes, não é? de Jorge Amado, Graciliano Ramos, Mário de Andrade, o Guimarães Rosa até foi quem chegou menos, provavelmente, mas, por exemplo, Jorge Amado estava proibido em Portugal Sim. e era autorizado nas colônias, pensando que as colônias não liam né? e, 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 portanto, ali não havia perigo. Agora, a, a situação já não é a mesma, infelizmente, quer dizer, nós agora não conhecemos o que é que, de novo, está sendo criado no Brasil, o que é que está chegando do Brasil. E, e a influência de Portugal agora é um, é um pouco mais presente. Portugal está hoje mais presente do que o Brasil. É, primeiro, assim, lugar de falo na literatura, acho que não. Né? Porque é, eu acho que a literatura é um espaço da liberdade. A Amanda está com uma, uma matéria na 451, belíssima, belíssima. É, a literatura em perigo. É, eu... eu eu acho que o lugar de fala não, no sentido de que é, é essa curiosidade e imaginação de se colocar no lugar do outro, uhum. que é a, a base da literatura. E eu trouxe a literatura, mas a gente pode expandir para outras artes também, né? Sim, sim. Uhum. E eu acho que as mulheres, é, todo o corpo produz sentido à sua maneira. We just have to keep going, we have to keep telling the stories. And my approach to storytelling is I don't tell stories from a place of ideology. I'm a feminist. Eu disse que era rápido, Roda Viva já está de volta. E quem pergunta agora o Jonathan Fraser é a Gabriela Maia. 
Você, as suas observações e as suas reflexões permitiram que você antecipasse algumas respostas sociais a dinâmicas e angústias coletivas que a gente viveu. Eu cito como exemplo a eleição do Trump nos Estados Unidos, sobre a qual você até falou já que no momento em que aconteceu, você momentaneamente se regozijou, porque viu vindo, né? entendeu que aquilo aconteceria. É, Para onde as suas antenas apontam agora? O que... Que movimentos e que dinâmicas sociais chamam especial atenção nesse momento e que você acha que vão ter repercussões futuras importantes? I have been right about a few things. I think I was right about social media. I was I I had an instinctive aversion to it when it first appeared in the form of Facebook and Twitter. Um, and it and that the Trump election in 2016 confirmed what I had been saying, which is this is actually harmful technology. This is not good for the culture. It's not good for society. Uh, it's making us angry. It's dividing us. And it is promoting lies. Um, it's a great platform for promoting lies. Um, and I didn't want to be vindicated, but I was vindicated. Uh, I also sadly think I'm right that we are not collectively as a global community going to make the changes necessary to come anywhere near meeting the uh, carbon reduction goals we need to to keep uh, the climate from really catastrophically veering out of control. Um, That remains to be seen, but the, the numbers don't look good. Uh, where we're going now, I would say the thing that's most on my radar is um, AI. I think artificial intelligence is a misnomer. I think this is not intelligence. These are very clever algorithms that are good at making guesses about what the next word in a sentence is going to be. That's not intelligence. Intelligence is what an animal has because an animal has goals and desires and intelligence helps them reach those goals. An algorithm has no goals and desires. It's just, you know, bits in a computer chip. There, it makes no sense to speak of intelligence. Nevertheless, I think we're very quickly going to reach the point where AI can produce such perfect fakes that it really looks like it's me here. And I am saying, I don't think the Holocaust happened and I favor uh, Trump for reelection in 2024. It will be indistinguishable from a video of me saying what I'm saying now. And that means, and that's all the more true for still photographs, it's true for audio. I think, I think this technology is going to be really phenomenally good at faking. And then you have a world in which there's no such thing as hard documentary evidence where where you can say, oh yes, but yeah, you say that, but here, here, here's the proof. Because we, you know, the only way you can really be sure of something is if you witness it yourself. But we live in a huge world and there are billions of people. You can't be everywhere at once. And so almost everything we know comes in some mediated form. And when th those media become 100% untrustworthy, we are in a very, very strange place. When all you have to do is type on your computer, I want to make it look like President Biden made this announcement in the Rose Garden today. And there it is, there's the video, and you circulate that on the web. You, the, the dam has broken. There's, there's, there's no way to keep that back. And it's going to require some, I, have, I don't even know where we go from there when you can't trust anything. Even, yep. and, 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 you know, it's one thing for me not to trust what I hear on Truth Social. Well, of course, that's a lie. Trump said it. But when, no, when you can't even trust what you're hearing, what you're being, what you, your own sources, um, that's, a, that's a crazy situation. And I don't know what we're going to do with it. 
Nesse sentido, é, Liberdade é um do o seu romance mais político, aquele na qual a política é um pano de fundo muito importante. A Era Bush e o pós 11 de setembro estão muito firmes ali. E em Pureza você aborda essa questão do ativismo digital e da, da forma como isso mexe com a sociedade hoje em dia. Essas duas questões, a tecnologia e o que ela pode ter de imbricação com a política, são assuntos que ainda te interessam como romancista ou você vai deixá-los mais para os seus ensaios? They don't interest me so much, and that's partly because I'm involved in a project that is going back into history. And I, and I do think, I'm aware that I'm getting older. Um, when I was 30 or 40, um, I was the new generation. I was the person who was having firsthand experience of what it was like to be a young person um, in this new technological world, and I had a lot to say about it. I can feel that whether I like it or not, I'm no longer at the cutting edge. Um, and I also think that it's just part of the natural aging process for a writer that you start at a certain age to become more interested in gardening. Um, <laughs> but also you become more interested in history uh, because you've actually lived long enough to have a sense of what it means to be historical. And so I don't see myself, um, except in interviews and maybe in some of the nonfiction, really engaging with that stuff in the same way, simply because I'm, 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 I'm too old. <laughs> Did. Um, apesar de, como você disse, muita gente considerar seus romances como familiares, o último, Encruzilhada, seria o primeiro deles, a primeira saga familiar, o que fez dessa família em particular demandar tanto de você, demandar uma trilogia? Seria talvez uma identificação sua, até pela época em que ele é construído, que foi a época em que você uh, cresceu? That's part of it. I think if I do write two more volumes, it will cover pretty much my whole life. Um, it remains to be seen whether there are two more volumes worth of story about this, these particular characters. I've never tried to write a second novel about characters I've already written about. It's not easy. Um, I feel in certain ways I already told the stories. What more is there to say? Well, I do have some ideas about things that happen to the family later. And in fact, the whole project began because I had in mind a particularly terrible thing that happens later. Uh, I, what makes them worthy of this? Um, that's the thing about writing, I would say, most realist fiction. It's not about particularly extraordinary characters. Uh, What makes them extraordinary is the intensity of the story they're involved in. And if I can keep on finding intense stories, um, new stories for these characters, I think it will be possible to write it. Uh, the, the chief attraction, I have to say, was the opportunity to see what it's like 25 years later or even 50 years later and to see what the children of people who were young in the first volume are like, um, and even the grandchildren, what they're like. Uh, it's, I, I am a family guy, my family's very important to me. I think a lot about it, and I, I think I do have an opportunity to, to trace something more historical, less of the moment, here's a, a social reality and here's a family in it. Here's something that actually gets at something maybe deeper about what it means to be a person. Graeme? Uh, Franzen, você acaba de falar que você é um, um cara de família, né? Mas até onde eu sei, você não tem filhos. É, você escreve muito sobre famílias, mas não tem filhos. E a gente estava conversando sobre a questão de ser um escritor, homem, da masculinidade. Se você fosse uma mulher, uma autora, quase que inevitavelmente a questão dos filhos teria aparecido em algum momento na, na conversa. Talvez até numa pergunta mais apontando o dedo, por que você não teve filhos? Eu vou apontar o dedo para você, por que você não teve <risos> filhos? It just didn't work out that way. Um, 
I met a woman, so I was married and that didn't work very well. Um, and then some years later, I met a woman, a Californian, who was very clear she had no interest in having kids. And I was completely in love with her. And I th had always thought, oh, I would have some children. And it became a point of conflict for us. And yet I really, really love this woman. And at a certain point, I began to wonder if I'm so intent on having children, if that's so important to me, why did I choose this person who from the beginning said, I don't want children? And I think in the fullness of time, I realized it's because I felt I was supposed to have children rather than, oh, I love little kids. I want to have them in the house for 18 or 20 years. Um, actually, I don't love little children. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the simple question. And, and I have two brothers and they both have two kids. And those nephews are important to me. And it was very clear, they always liked little kids. I didn't like little kids. In fact, I didn't like myself when I was a little kid. I couldn't wait to be a, an adult. So those are some reasons. Não foi por uma razão filosófica como daqui a 50 anos talvez o mundo não exista mais, nada disso. Well, that's actually kind of a nice thing, though. I, um, I feel a lot of guilt about what I personally am doing to the planet, but I am I have I have taken the most important step I can take personally, <laughs> which is not to have children uh, in terms of climate change. Uh, but that's not why I didn't have kids. And it's not like I disapprove of my friends who do have kids. Oh, they're adding more people to the world and there will be more demands on the resources. I don't I, you know, um, people do what 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 is good for them. And it turned out, I don't think I would have written as much or as well if I had also been trying to be a father. So it's it's really personal. The philosophical part, um, that's just a bonus. O <laughs> Biratã. Jonathan, a gente pode ver muitas entrevistas suas nas redes sociais, na internet. É, essa daqui já vai também, mais uma. Em algumas você aparece ligeiramente desconfortável. É, não, não nem esconde isso aqui aparentemente também tá bem é, o, o que que você leva de entrevistas o que você se é que aprende o que que você aprende dessas conversas what do I learn from an interview uh, well I get some practice at doing them um, my favorite kind of interview uh, is also my least favorite, and that is an email interview <laughs> where I get the questions in written form, and I can reply exactly as I as if I, as I wish I could speak. Um, <clears throat> I hate that interview because it takes five hours, um, and I think the discomfort for me in an interview is I can hear what I'm saying. And even as I'm saying it, I'm thinking I could be writing that so much better and so much more clearly. It, and there's a frustration with the spoken word. Um, one of the things I have learned, especially from doing television, is that it's not just about the words. It's about the aspect. Are you do you seem friendly? Um, and you have to ask yourself, well, what's the point of an interview? point of an interview rarely for me is I have some idea I need to get out there. If I have an idea I really want to get out there, I will write about it. Um, so most interviews, including this one, are fundamentally because I'm trying to help my publishers, <laughs> um, which is to say, um, Companhia, a wonderful Brazilian publisher. They've been very good to me. I love them. I love Luis Schwartz, uh, the publisher. And um, I want him to help get word out about Crossroads. And I also think it's a good book and I want people to read it. And by making an appearance like this on a show like this, maybe it will increase sales for Luis and it will bring the book in front of people who might not have found their way to it otherwise. 
And so they're, a, they're kind of a necessary evil, and I've learned <laughs> to try to enjoy them as much as I can. Uh, but there's always this frustration because I'm just not as articulate when I'm speaking as when I'm writing. Bom, para nosso pesar e para talvez alívio do Jonathan, só falta um bloco. Então a gente vai para o nosso último intervalo. Volta já já com o encerramento dessa maravilhosa entrevista com Jonathan Fraser. <risos> Cultura que emociona. Bradesco. Você leva isso para a literatura, essa ideia, assim, você acha que o livro tem que divertir muito mais do que educar, do que formar? Esse raciocínio Olha, você eu usa, acredito né? muito que a literatura educa, não porque ela ensina, mas porque ela é arte. E eu acredito na educação pela arte. Eu acredito que quando o livro é bom, quando o livro é literariamente bem escrito, é uma forma de educação. Agora, não acredito, nem, nem acho que a pessoa que escreve deva se imbuir assim do espírito pedagógico, que aí fica tudo muito chato. Né? Se você, querida, fizer um levantamento dos duzentos e tantos membros acadêmicos, você vai ver que a grande média a grande maioria é da classe média, quando mais, inclusive muitos de origem modesta. Portanto, não é um local da elite econômica ou da elite social. Um ou outro que tinha um nome de família mais significado, mais importante. Então, agora, quando você fala na língua, você não fala na língua culta, você fala na língua portuguesa em todas as suas vertentes variantes, todas as suas variantes. Tudo que se produz em literatura é língua portuguesa, entendeu? Não, não, isso, isso não existe. Eu tenho a impressão que você está equivocada, porque nós, nós temos que defender o que se escreve. Até defender, eu vou lhe dizer uma coisa, até o texto quebrado, o texto é, é, incorreto, não importa. É uma produção, é um livro, é uma criação tem toda a defesa da academia, mais do que da academia, de nós que escrevemos. Nós tivemos influências enormes, não é? de Jorge Amado, Graciliano Ramos, Mário de Andrade. O Guimarães Rosa até foi quem chegou menos, provavelmente, mas, por exemplo, Jorge Amado estava proibido em Portugal Sim. e era autorizado nas colónias, pensando que as colónias não liam não é? e, 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 portanto, ali não havia perigo. Agora, a, a situação já não é a mesma, infelizmente, quer dizer, nós agora não conhecemos o que é que de novo está sendo criado no Brasil, o que é que está chegando no Brasil. E, Mas... e a influência de Portugal agora é um, é um pouco mais presente. Portugal está hoje mais presente do que o Brasil. É, primeiro, assim, lugar de falo na literatura, acho que não. Né? Porque é, eu acho que a literatura é um espaço da liberdade. A Amanda está com uma, uma matéria na 451, belíssima, belíssima. É, a literatura em perigo. É, eu, eu, eu acho que lugar de fala não, no sentido de que é, é essa curiosidade e imaginação de se colocar no lugar do outro, uhum. que é a, a base da literatura. E eu trouxe a literatura, mas a gente pode expandir para outras artes também, né? Sim, sim. Uhum. E eu acho que as mulheres... É, Todo o corpo produz sentido à sua maneira. We just have to keep going. We have to keep telling the stories. And my approach to storytelling is I don't tell stories from a place of ideology. I'm a feminist. Estamos de volta com Roda Viva com Jonathan Frenzy. Jonathan, as suas obras se prestariam, acho que elas se prestam, a séries, a esse novo modelo de séries que se faz nos Estados Unidos em que a carpintaria dos personagens é bem feita e que a representação de um período de tempo também é muito rica em detalhes. Pureza chegou a ser... É, 
ter os seus direitos adquiridos para uma série que foi sendo postergada. Qual é a sua experiência com a transposição das suas obras para o audiovisual e se você gosta de se envolver nessa parte, é, inclusive dando palpites no roteiro? Uh, I have been involved in several attempts to put my books on TV. Um, a very unhappy attempt to, to do the corrections uh, back about 10 years ago. A much happier experience with Purity. I got to work with the director, Todd Field, uh, who made most recently the movie Tar, a wonderful movie. And Todd taught me how to write a screenplay. And I ended up writing 11 hours of the show. We wrote 20 hours all together. And it was a beautiful thing. And um, the only problem was, well, it would have cost too much money to make those 20 hours. And uh, I, I have to say, it was really fun. Um, we were working with Daniel Craig as well. and. Just for several months, the three of us and um, a few other people sat in a room and talked about how to do the best version we could on TV of the book. And it involved actually writing a lot of new material. So we were, we were sort of brainstorming day after day how to do this. And writing is such a solitary task, has always been a solitary task for me, to feel like I was part of a team. Um, and that I was a valuable member of the team, I would be, you know, we would agree, you need to write hour seven by September 30th, and that's only two weeks out, and I would say, okay, I will do it, you can count on me, and then to do it and deliver it, and also to, for Todd to say the same thing, I'll get this done and have him get it done, to be part of a team, it's such a different experience for me. Um, And yeah, now there are some other, uh, I've been working on a second attempt to put uh, crossroad, uh, corrections on television and doing some writing there as well. It's, it's fun to adapt your own work. It's like, I don't have to get to know the characters. I know the characters. Mm -hmm. And it, it's different from writing a novel completely because it's not new material. Uh, it's more like doing this crossword puzzle where you are trying to fit in a thousand different things that need to happen and in the right sequence with the right rhythm. I enjoy it. It's not as big a challenge as actually writing a novel, but I really enjoy it. Certo, Greb. É, você estava falando agora há pouco sobre as obrigações do lançamento de um livro, ajudar os editores e tudo mais. Eu me lembrei de uma entrevista que eu fiz muitos anos atrás com o Martin Ames, que acabou de morrer. Eu era bem mais novo. Eu perguntei para ele do que os escritores ingleses, tinha uma comunidade grande de escritores né, na Inglaterra naquele momento, todos mais ou menos da mesma idade, eles se encontravam, eram amigos, do que eles conversavam? E eu estava esperando uma resposta profunda e ele disse, nós conversamos sobre dinheiro. É, eu, logo depois ele acrescentou, mas eu também gosto, também me interesso por dinheiro como um tema literário. É, eu queria que você falasse um pouquinho das duas coisas. Dinheiro é um assunto literário que lhe parece interessante. E qual o papel do dinheiro na vida de um escritor? Como, como escolher o caminho do escritor? É, tem alguma recompensa financeira ainda para se encontrar nesse caminho? Ou você talvez tenha sido a última geração que conseguiu isso? Well, there's still money in writing. And uh, we have a writer's strike going on with the screenwriters. Uh, I'm part of that union. I'm on strike right now. <laughs> I cannot write a screenplay now because my union is on strike um, because the entire model for how content is disseminated has changed since our last contract. Um, there's, there's always demand for content and content providers can still make a living at it. But money as a theme in literature, I am, I'm actually amazed that not more novelists realize how fun it is to write about money. It has been an important plot element in almost all of my novels for the simple reason that if you want to get a reader's attention, if you want to get my attention as a reader, here's what you write. You write in the first sentence, He owed his sister $20,000 and he didn't know how he was going to pay her back. <laughs> yeah, it's like, 
I'm interested. What's the next sentence? What's the next chapter? Um, it's uh, because we all need money. And it's this basic need. It's a basic desire. And desire is the driver of all fiction um, and all drama, people wanting something. And, and there's nothing more universal, really. Some people can do without love. No one can do without <laughs> money. It's this wonderful constantly self-refreshing resource for the storyteller. Tell a story about money. Um, and yeah, so it's, and that is actually a point of commonality uh, between me and Martin Amos. There aren't many points of commonality, uh, but he, he also got that money. Look at the 19th century. I mean, all those books, uh, they turn on money. They turn on inheritances. Oh my God, inheritances! What a wonderful, what a wonderful story. Who, who is going to get the old man's money? Um, Brothers Karamazov, greatest novel ever written. Who's going to get the money? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. E isso está presente também nas encruzilhadas com a tia. Só dando um leve spoiler. Absolutely, and it. <laughs> No, no, it's fine, and and there is a there. It's true. There's an inheritance, a small inheritance in Crossroads, and that's the thing. It doesn't have to be. I have had sums of money in previous novels. Purity. There was a a billion dollars in my second novel, Strong Motion. There was twenty two million dollars in Crossroads. I realized, you know what, thirteen thousand dollars <laughs> is is just as important as a billion dollars or $22 million. Um, a matter of a hundred dollars can be something that you can write a big chunk of a novel about. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a mystery why it works so well for the novelist, but it really does. <laughs> Maravilhoso. Gabi. Eu queria sair da literatura e te perguntar sobre o futuro do planeta. O que a sua prática de observar pássaros mostra sobre o rumo para onde o rumo que a gente está seguindo no planeta? O que, que os pássaros te contam sobre a velocidade com que as mudanças climáticas estão acontecendo? Birds are in trouble around the world, um, and I'm very involved in bird conservation efforts. I know a lot about it, and We are all worried about what drastic, sudden climate change is going to do to those bird populations. But honestly, everywhere I look, the problem is not climate. If you look at seabirds, uh, albatrosses, petrels, um, penguins, all of those things, yes, you can see perhaps that climate is having an impact, the warming is having an impact, but it's nothing compared to the impact from invasive species um, that have taken over the islands where the seabirds breed. It's nothing compared to what we're doing to the ocean's fisheries. We're basically emptying the oceans. It's stupid, it's short-sighted. We'll fish out the oceans, there will be nothing left, and then what do you do? It's bad for us. But it's also bad for the birds that depend on those fish. Everywhere you look, habitat loss, the Brazilian Amazon, the deforestation that is, continues to be a problem. Um, and again, very short term, very short sighted destruction of uh, the forest, which will have climatic effects. Um, but that's that is not actually a climate issue, that's a habitat loss issue. So I actually, right now, from what I see, looking at bird populations, I see a, a consumption of resources that is completely unsustainable. Um, and in the medium term, that's bad for other species, but also in the pretty medium term, it's going to be bad for us because it's not sustainable. Well, 
Bom, voltando um pouco para o Encruzilhadas, um dos grandes personagens do livro é a mãe, a Marion, que a gente já conversou sobre ela aqui, que é a mulher do pastor que tem um passado cheio de traumas e segredos. Ela foi muito elogiada pelos críticos como uma das grandes personagens da sua obra. É, em outros livros, representações femininas acabaram criticadas. Você mesmo já disse numa palestra que a sua esposa chegou a te perguntar por que as mulheres nos seus livros acabavam com frequência mortas ou feridas com armas de fogo. Você pode contar um pouco como foi a construção dessa personagem feminina e se construir personagens femininas tão completas foi um aprendizado para você e por que você acha que você foi tão bem sucedido justamente numa época em que estamos tão atentos a como homens escrevem sobre mulheres? I think the good novelists have always uh, written well about characters of both sexes. I realize that gender no longer should be considered binary, but we're talking among friends, so it's men and women, um, historically. And what happened, I think, uh, in American fiction, um, really beginning with Hemingway and running through the post-war, post-modern novelists, was that there was this kind of over-the-top maleness to that writing. And female characters were, uh, they were there for the men to enjoy. And um, novelists who were really very good at certain things, uh, again, Heller, Joseph Heller, or Philip Roth, were not good at creating female characters. I don't actually think John Updike was particularly good at creating female characters. But that was more of a historical anomaly. I think always, whether whether the writer is male or female, part of the basic requirements of the job is you should be able to write about any character. Um, and and I think if if you can get right in your head so that for the male novelist, the female character is not just a sexually attractive object but a full person, it's not that hard. Um, and we have abundant experience beginning with our mothers, uh, we male novelists, you know, I've, I've, I've had conversations with women every day of my life. Um, why shouldn't I be able to write a good character? Mm -hmm. okay. It's true that in my first two novels, harm comes to the female characters and I really decided I don't want to do that anymore. I don't, it was, that had to do with private rage issues. Um, and I've, I've, I think outgrown that. Pedro. Fazendo um gancho com a pergunta do Juan, uh, eu vi uma entrevista sua que você fala que leu Helena Ferrante, a tetralogia dela, e gostou muito. E esse livro, essa tetralogia é considerada pelas leitoras, principalmente leitoras femininas, como uma descrição muito uh, específica e bem feita do universo feminino. Seria também a literatura uma forma de você conhecer mais sobre universos que são diferentes do seu, para conseguir trazer isso no seu, nas suas obras, na construção dos seus personagens? Não, eu não estava lendo reading Ferrante para pick up information. I was reading her because um, she's got the magic. The first of those four Neapolitan novels, My Brilliant Friend, it's really just about a couple of girls in a neighborhood, a poor neighborhood in Naples. And yet every sentence counts. It's what I was saying earlier about a real writer finds their own voice and that voice is in every single sentence and doesn't write sentences that anyone else could write or has written. And I felt that the overall project of the Neapolitan novels with Ferrante, which was to describe the complete picture of an intense female friendship. No one had ever done that before. It was always waiting to be done. And here was Ferrante doing it. Uh, so that was exciting because um, that friendship, it's got a lot in it. It's got, it's got this love, it's got this rivalry, it's got this competition. Um, it's got 
each side inflicting pain on the other, um, and history going back to earliest childhood, it's a huge subject. It's worthy of four novels, and she pulled it off. Jonathan, muito obrigada pela sua entrevista. Foi um prazer te ouvir. Foi um deleite. Um, thank you, thank you to the panel. Um, there were a bunch of really good questions, and I would say that this was relatively painless as an interview. <laughs> so thank you all for your for your for reading the book and for um, giving some thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. É isso, além de agradecer muito ao Jonathan Frenzen pela entrevista, agradeço também a esse lindo time que dividiu os trabalhos comigo hoje. Carlos Graeb, Gabriela Maier, Pedro Pacífico, Juan de Souza Gabriel e o Biratã Brasil por, pelas perguntas e a Luli Pena e a Leslie Cohen por traduzir a entrevista em imagens e palavras. Obrigada sobretudo a você pela sua audiência semana a semana. Não é trivial no mundo que a cada dia quer acelerar a vida encarar um livro de 9, 596 páginas, é um catatal, cuja ação se passa quase toda num intervalo de poucos meses na vida de uma única família, uma família comum. No entanto, o leitor que se dispuser a sair do scroll letárgico das redes sociais e encarar o engenho, vai se deparar com momentos de profundo reconhecimento de si, dos seus, do mundo ao seu redor nessas páginas. E é por isso que a grande literatura tem essa capacidade única de nos conectar com quem somos no momento em que o mundo oferece apenas escapismo fugaz. A gente volta na próxima semana com mais um Roda Viva imperdível, como sempre, às 10 da noite. Até lá! Emociona. Bradesco, 